G'day. Here's all going. Welcome to Australia. And as I welcome you, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we stand, who are the first clinicians and the first innovators. We're going to look back on that journey over the last terrible 12 months and see how well we've done. And then stand on the shoulders of the men and women that came before us to look forward to what we may produce and learn over the next 12 months. Good morning and welcome again to ELSO 2021. Last year I was honoured to be chosen as the ELSO 2020 speaker and had to deliver in the height of the pandemic our presentation from my living room. By no means are we through this COVID pandemic but at least we can do a little bit of travel even to the great outdoors if not travel across the seas. Though I'm certain we all hope that time is coming soon. My hope through today is to look at the innovation that has brought us to this point and will hopefully bring us even further to this, the medical disaster of the 21st century. If we look on a time scale of how far we have come and how much innovation has allowed us to achieve in a year, last year at the same time there was no vaccine. Now we have three, four and five vaccines. In November 2020, a month after we spoke, Pfizer released its vaccine data showing around 95% efficacy, soon to be followed by AstraZeneca and Moderna in December. And the date we all looked forward to of December the 8th, with a lovely English grandmother was the first person to be vaccinated. Time marched so incredibly quickly we suddenly had a vaccine, we had dexamethasone treatments, we started to learn about other treatments, interleukin-6 blockers, tozoluximab, we realised the potential of anticoagulants, the potential risks of convalescent plasma. But bit by bit by bit, through working together, the ECMO community, the infectious disease community, the virologists, and generally the people came together to fight this once in a lifetime pandemic. However, looking through that timeline, even as vaccinations started to really take off in January or February of last year, and mortality started to drip off, we started to see variants from South Africa and from the UK. And there was a fear that despite the vaccinations and their efficacy, if these variants became more and more common, that they may become resistant to the vaccination. In March, COVAX started to do some fantastic work in allowing vaccines to be spread, not just from the rich and wealthy countries, but to the poorer countries too. It was around that time that we started to realise how well ECMO could actually work. And the data from our own ELSA registry showed that ECMO definitely was a key component of the treatment in this pandemic. Other things worked too. Steroids we learned from our Oxford group worked well. We learned simple manoeuvres like prone ventilation, but as we progressed through our understanding and increased this understanding of both modes of ventilation, modes of ECMO, and different anti-inflammatory and anticoagulant treatments, it was at this time we started to hear increasing stories of lack of oxygen availability. Whilst the states had passed a horrible landmark of 100,000 patients per day in January, India, surpassed 400,000 patients of confirmed cases per day in April. Speaking to our colleagues in India, they tell me that so many of the places could not keep up with testing that this figure is a vast underestimation. And with such a huge burden across such a massive continent and massive population, oxygen became the defining factor. We saw on televisions people scrabbling for oxygen buying in the black market cylinders of oxygen, taking their relatives on rickshaws to hospitals that could not give them what we consider to be the simplest modality of treatment that we in the wealthier countries have never really had to consider. The clinicians struggled, but they kept turning up day after day despite the risks of themselves and their family. People across the world tried to help India created its own vaccine, increased its ventilator capacity 
and oxygen distribution were assisted by great organisations and distribution of data and advice from across the world. But still they suffered. Whilst COVAX was a fantastic idea to distribute the vaccine across the world, it really has not been able to do quite the same. It's something we've always known in medicine, that prevention of a disease is much better, much more cost effective than a cure. And the vaccine has done this and so much more. The mortality rate has dropped from seven to around two across those of us that are fortunate enough to receive a vaccine. In the wealthier countries, the number sits around 100 doses have been distributed by September 21 per 100 people. But we face the shame that at the same time, that dose is 1.5 doses per 100 in the low middle income countries. And it's not through lack of resource. Resource allocation has been a typical thing that we've all faced in intensive care. It's incredibly expensive and it's scarce, particularly in the less well-off countries. We've assessed this when we've looked at how many ventilators per patient and we've published on the same data, showing that there's a big variability of the doctor and clinician's cultural background as to who should or should not be ventilated. But with vaccination, this wasn't the problem. And day after day, when we watch the television, we see vaccines being thrown out unused because some patients do not like the specific flavour of the vaccination they are being offered. Perfectly good vaccinations with millions of scientific hours showing the validity. We must do better with vaccine equity as we must do with intensive care access to these patients. When one looks at the history of vaccinations, it's incredible what has been happening in the last year and a half. For typhoid fever, it took over 100 years for a vaccine to be developed. For hepatitis B, it took over 20 years. For the COVID-19 vaccine with the Pfizer drug, it took 225 days from the license deal to be signed in March till November when it was shown to be 95% efficacious. This shows what we in the medical community and the scientific community can do when we are unobstructed. But for some reason, anti-science is causing people's deaths. Because people are dying because of anti-science. We are putting ourselves at risk because when these anti-vaxxers do not get vaccinated, they still turn up in intensive care units. A year in medicine is a long time, and a year in a pandemic is even longer. In September 2020, when we last spoke, as you went to work, you were cheered. And I speak to many of you this year, in the same time, you are now being jeered. The mental health impact that has been felt by our clinicians cannot be overestimated. But equally, it cannot be actually measured. We can count patients, we can count deaths, we can count man and woman hours and a ventilator or ECMO, we can count renal dysfunction but I don't think there's an Excel spreadsheet that can count the pain and anguish from people unable to see their mother, unable to see their loved ones. Day after day, despite that pain, despite the heartache, you have turned up for work to look after those who jeer you at the front door. The patients that jeer us at that door are equally suffering, and perhaps this is some part of why they jeer those that next week or next month, when they refuse to take their vaccines, we'll be looking after them at the bedside in intensive care and simultaneously taking their risk of infection back to our families. The ICU community has stood strong, allied health, nursing and medical, and it's together that we will improve the outcomes of the vaccinated and of the unvaccinated. You're gonna hear over the next two or three days about some of the outstanding science that's been done Maybe not a whole answer, but each part of information that you have gathered through this pandemic is another brick in the wall of knowledge. And it's the camaraderie that we share is the cement that binds these bricks together. There's too many papers and too many studies to mention, and that's why you have two more days to listen to these. But some of my own key favourites would be the Rosalind Group with Kenny Bailey, identifying the genes that determine who gets sick and who doesn't get sick based on their COVID. 
the fact that we can use prone, spontaneous breathing on patients to improve outcome. The fact that steroids are $5 a day treatment can save 30% plus of lives. This is the spirit of innovation that this society was formed upon. And this is the spirit of camaraderie that I love to say that I am part of. Last year when we spoke, there was a huge amount of discussion about should we let the virus run rampant because it was too expensive to curtail it and stop infection. But it's become very, very clear that by treating the virus, by reducing the infection rate, that is the only way to the economy to move forward and ahead. We're starting to see long COVID, which can be 20 or 30% of all patients who have suffered COVID. And as the after core will show, those that are in intensive care with COVID will have a much higher burden of disease. And the cost of dealing with those with long COVID, we really don't know, but we can assume it's going to be huge. And so protection of the economy is actually a key aspect of what we are doing as medics. The pandemic has shown us that medicine can be front and centre stage and innovation is the way out of this. When in the past has it ever happened that ECMO or mRNA or PCR are words that we see on a daily basis on our front page of the newspapers? It shows us that we as a medical community are leaders in both in ECMO and ICU, but we also should be leaders in society because society and medicine have interdigitated during the pandemic as never before. Now is our time to stand as medical leaders, but as leaders to the global community. And we are so very, very fortunate that those that founded the ELSO community 30 odd years ago are exactly that and are standing up despite political interference in different countries. So each morning, as I start to read the emails coming in from across the world or looking at the 35 million data points that COVID Critical has now gathered from 55 countries, feeling slightly fraudulent based here in Queensland where we've seen almost none of the disease. I'm inspired by you, my colleagues and friends across the world. I'm in awe of the innovation, the studies that continue regardless of the hours you're spending in the intensive care. But perhaps even more importantly, I'm in awe of the position that we are starting to take on the forefront, negating the anti-science because this is the way for us to produce better outcomes. And I think this is our time that we really have to stand to the fore and speak to society and to say that together we can crush this COVID curve. We're by no means through this pandemic. You, in the thick of battle, see this day after day, wave after crushing wave, that we are still seeing deaths and morbidity in the acute phase and we will see the same in the long phase. But equally, countries are starting to open up. We are starting to see small shoots of normal life return. People going to clubs, pubs, restaurants, people traveling. And it's phenomenal to see and to think that the innovation and the work done by the ELSO community has been a massive part of this. And whilst no one wants to be premature declaring the end of a pandemic, perhaps we are at the beginning of the end Perhaps next year we can meet face to face and say that together with the spirit of ELSO in innovation, collaboration and education, we have beaten this, the largest medical crisis of our time. But perhaps there is an even bigger medical emergency, much more insidious, much less visible, but its impact will be felt for centuries to come. Climate change, as defined by the New England Journal of Medicine and all the other medical journals, is the medical crisis of our time. It's not a political statement, it's a scientific statement. Data across hundreds of journals is irrefutable. The unanimous signatories prior to the Glasgow meeting of all the medical journals is a once in a lifetime event. But perhaps this almost empty dam in out west Queensland says it so much more eloquently than any journal could ever. As we came onto this property this morning, we spoke to the farmer. He normally runs several hundred head of cattle in this area and he's down to six. The world and this crisis is heating up. Since 2015, 
five of the hottest years in the last hundred have occurred. The ground is drier than ever before and the subsoil dies with that. We can watch the bushfires from Australia a couple of years ago, the Amazon, the States almost every year, Siberia, and we see countless millions of acres being devastated. Trees that have taken over 200 years to grow take seconds to die. Each year, hundreds of species are being made extinct and they will never come back. The animals that existed around that have got less and less habitat in which they live, so they move closer and closer into human proximity. And it's in these positions that diseases move from the animal kingdom into the human kingdom, into a growing epidemic of zoonoses. So too with humans. As the ground becomes drier and there's more and more extreme weather events, there's inadequacy of food source and people will migrate. And it is anticipated that climate change will become one of the major causes of warfare as populations move from dry, arid lands to find lands and communities on which they can sustain their families. The WHO has analysed the data and it's clear. Every year, four and a half to five million die of poor air quality. That's more than has died in 18 months from COVID. A study from Monash University has shown that approximately six million people die each year from extreme heat events. Now, we're not going to compare mortalities, but COVID, please God, will go, and I hope it goes soon. There will be no vaccine for climate change. We have to do better because in a similar way with COVID, it is the poorer nations that will struggle more. I'm embarrassed to say that Australia is one of the worst causes of carbon pollution across the world and one of the richest countries. Again, the low middle income countries are crushed between the weight of the carbon that the richer countries produce. They are more dependent on the land and they feel the burden of climate change more than the rich countries in the same way they've felt the burden of COVID more than the richer countries. The economies of the West say it's too expensive for us to change. And yet again, this is shown not to be the case. Prime Ministers have again failed in their duty to realise their job is to lead, whether it is popular or unpopular. Prime Ministers and leaders across the world for too long have said, this is not real science, it's too expensive. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. Won't the Treasurer you. knows the rule on crops. It's coal. It was dug up by men and women who work and live in the electorates of those who sit opposite. And the climate denialists are in effect the anti-vaxxers of the future of our world. We don't have it any more time. This is doable. The United Nations and the World Health Organization have all projected that the costs of leaving the climate unchecked far outweigh the costs of reducing carbon, of looking at cleaner, sustainable energy and farming practices. We're already lagging behind it. There's many statements of intent. The time for intent has passed. The time for action is now. What is our role in this? We are the leaders of the medical community. We are the last bastion of defence in COVID. We have worked tirelessly with our colleagues across infectious disease, virology, vaccine produce, production and public health. Together, the medical fraternity can band together and say enough is enough. When I think about how far we, the ECMO community, and you, the people on the battle lines, have come from September 2020 to 2021, it's truly inspiring. History will look back on this time and our hope is that our children are inspired and are proud of what we have done in crushing the COVID curve. But the question remains, if they give us an A plus for the work we've done with COVID, might we get an F minus for how we've avoided and ignored the true global crisis that is climate change. The time to act is now. This is science and this is our responsibility.
In the words of Muhammad Ali, a man who would always speak out against injustice, no matter how unpopular it was at that time. Impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to use the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing.